This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for Avoid the Maze, You Are Special. And my guest today is special. Sometimes we don't want to be known as the special needs parent, but you know what? That's what we are. And we all have special needs. Don't have to have an illness or a disability to have special needs. But in Janine's case, she has an 11-year-old son, and he does have special needs. And therefore, your life is not probably the way you thought it was going to be when you were a young girl thinking about maybe getting married and having a family. So take us on your journey. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, when I was, you know, growing up, I didn't, I, I absolutely, you don't, you don't think you're going to have a special needs child, right? And even when I was a speech therapist early on, I was so grateful that I didn't have a child with special needs. They didn't have children at the time, but I thought, well, I'm not going to have a child with special needs. I'm a speech therapist. I work with children with special needs, but I won't have one. And thankfully I, I wouldn't have one. And, you know, as time went on, I had my child, I have my son, Che, and I love him dearly. Um, he actually just turned 12 this weekend. So he's no longer an 11 year old. He's quite very much a tween. Yeah. And you know, when I had him, he was perfect, you know, because he was, you know, had all of his toes and fingers and he was growing just great and, and babbling and doing all kinds of stuff. And, and just when he was toddling, um, you know, around 13 months, he unfortunately had a fall from our bed and it was very much an accident. You know, I had got him, got him, him out of the shower, put him on the bed and turned around to grab some lotion and he was so quick he just crawled his way off and fell and the bed was only 18 inches off the ground but he hit his head in just the perfect way to give himself a big brain bleed and mm -hmm. he had to have an emergency craniotomy and a few days later he had a stroke and you know to add insult to injury they thought we actually tried to hurt him because the fall was so short and that whole process of going to going through, you know, having to go through DCFS and having to prove that you were a good parent was difficult on top of sure. having to deal with this new injury your child has and this new disability and this new world that you're going to have to live in. It was very, very traumatic. And we lived in the hospital for three months and we spent Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's between 2013 and 2014 in the hospital living there. So it was, it was a lot to deal with. And, you know, um, I wasn't allowed to be alone with my child for 10 months. And, you know, I was, I lived in the hospital with him, but I, w I always, I always had to have a nurse there or somebody there to watch me, which was as a mother, it was so, um, it was just hurtful in a sense, you know, because I knew that I was a good mom. And I just felt like people were always judging me. Um, but it wasn't, you know, I didn't, I could not sit in that moment. I had to move on and move forward because my son is 12 now. And although he still has right hemiparesis, he doesn't use his right arm or hand. And he has some balance and agility issues with his right leg. You know, he's an amazing kid and he still gets special ed, special education. And he needs all the services. He has a adult support because he developed seizures a few years ago. And it's very unfortunate. But, you know, that person at, that's at school with him helps to keep him safe, helps to keep him focused for academics. And he's made such progress. He's in a charter school that has special education services. So he is mainstreamed for the most part. And he does have all these, all this, all these therapists to help him in school and everything. So the journey continues and thankfully I'm a speech therapist and he gets speech every day and you know his language is really good he has great conversations and he is very empathetic and has the biggest heart and I can't I couldn't wish for a better child you know it's interesting that like you said you know you're a therapist and you you knew you were going to have a perfect child and Perfection, we all look at it differently. Uh, when my son was diagnosed at the age of six, being on the autism spectrum, 
it was like, well, one day you were just neurotypical and now somebody's just diagnosed you and you've got, you know, an issue. And I refuse to accept that. I mean, I accepted the fact that, okay, he had the diagnosis, but I, I did not accept the fact that, hey, this means anything any different. We're going to, you know, we're going to be parents as if nothing else has changed. But we'll be careful along the way. And there were times that, you know, I thought I was the worst mom in the world. I had him when I was 40 years old. <gasps> must be my fault. We had to go through infertility. Oh, that must be our fault. Um, so I can't imagine what it's like when your child has an accident and now the world looks at you as, hey, mom, we don't think you did anything wrong, but we're not going to let you be alone with your child. That's got to be the most difficult part of wanting your child to get well, because now you have to get well from the judgment that's going on around you. So how did you do that? Because that had to have been difficult. Oh, absolutely. It was, it was the most difficult thing I had to get through, you know, um, because I was judged so harshly by people who did not know me as a person. They, they didn't know me before his accident. They just judged me based on his injuries and the severity of his injuries. And, um, you know, in the emergency room, you know, as my son Che was getting intubated and getting rushed off to have a craniotomy, you know, his dad is breaking down down the hall and I'm holding it together. You know, I'm just like, I'm holding it together. And uh, the social worker at the time was like, oh, do you want to sit down and talk? And I said, can you please just give us some time? You know, can you give us, I'm watching my son get intubated down the hall. I could see into the room and um, I just needed some time. You know, I wasn't breaking down at that moment, but in her report, she said I was a cold hearted mother for not breaking down. And I was like, wow, that was very judgmental because everybody deals with trauma in their own way. And uh, thankfully we had, you know, I had to go through parent training um, and it was more, you know, the parent, the, the social worker that, um, that what did my parent training, he knew that I wasn't the kind of person who would hurt my child intentionally. And so the, a lot of those sessions were like therapy sessions, you know, talking it out and, and having to uh, be able to, you know, talk it through and, learn like you know what I can do better to be more you know mindful about you know how I move through my day rather than rushing 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 sure. maybe I was rushing you know who knows but we can't change the past but we can change the future sure. so it was a lot of you know reflection and and building up like a, a thick skin and not not feeling like everyone was judging me just like exactly. these people in this pr particular situation was. You know, it's interesting that you talk about the age of your child when this happened. Um, my youngest son, he probably was a little younger than that. We were visiting friends and she wanted a baby so badly. And so she was holding um, my son and, he turned in her arms and he flipped over and hit the floor. And at first there was no cry. And I probably was maybe a foot or two away from her. I, I couldn't move. I mean, it was like, I knew she didn't do it, but it was like, why didn't any of us see it and stop it? As it turns out, he was absolutely fine. He did have a bump on his head and on the way home from their house, my husband said, we're going to the emergency room. Nobody judges, nobody asks anything like that. But I can't imagine, because as you're telling me, I'm thinking, oh my God, that could have been us, you know? And things sometimes just happen in life that are unexplainable. Um, and I just, 
I can't imagine, and I'm so sorry that you had to go through that, but it probably made you a stronger person in the end. And you got some additional training that maybe you would never have gotten before. So we have yeah, to I, I'm to definitely the, the strongest that I've ever been, you know, after that situation and having to deal with um, difficult people and having to, you know, bite your tongue when you really want to stand up for yourself when it's, you know, not the appropriate time to do that. Um, so learning how to stand up for yourself, also biting your tongue at certain times um, and having to just, you know, move forward and, and look at what's important. And my son was what was what was important, you know, to get him better as fast as we could. So sure. I had gotten him, you know, early intervention services as soon as we got home from the hospital. And, you know, he was getting services in the hospital as well. But as soon as we got home, you know, we had everything. We had occupational therapy, physical therapy. We had infant stimulation. We had a speech therapist because I had to go back to work at some point, right? Sure. And I wanted to make sure that somebody was going to be working with him. And a great team, you know, of, of people was, they were very helpful. And then after he turned three, you know, he went to the school system and he continues to be in the school system and he's thriving. You know, he does basketball at the YMCA and they're very in inclusive for him. And he's learned to do things like Taekwondo and everything. So he's, he's learned a lot and, you know, being a parent for a special needs child really helped me be a better therapist as well a better speech therapist because before you, before I had a special needs child, I could see the world of speech therapy in one lens, right? As a therapist. And I had empathy for parents, but I didn't really understand it. You know, I had, maybe I had sympathy for parents, but I didn't really understand it. Now I have empathy. I have more relatability. I have, you know, a 360 view because I can see what they were are seeing, you know, and they realize that and they trust me better and they have a better like like rapport with me because I I have gone through something similar or maybe even worse or whatever it is, but something that's um that's relatable. Well, I know when I was growing up, my mother used to make the comment, you know. Misery loves company. And so when my son was diagnosed, I started seeking out other parents. And um, in my case, it it was it did not work well for me. My son is very high functioning. And so the average person, when they see him, they have no idea he's on the spectrum. Um, when he has had his little episodes, yeah, people thought, what is wrong with this child? Um, and what is wrong with mother for not controlling him? Well, we lost friends. Friends just like disappeared. And I was speaking to somebody else this morning and they said, I went through the same thing. People started to move away. Now, this was back in the 90s. And in the 90s, most people didn't even really know much about autism, ADHD. There was all sort of like, yeah, what is it? Today, as you've talked about, we have more services available, but sadly, the average doctor out there who is diagnosing our children doesn't know where to find these services or if they're even available for your diagnosis. That's why I think parents like yourself and like myself are so needed in the communities because we've already gone through a lot of those battles. We sort of know where to go looking, but we also know that we have to be an advocate for our children and more so than the neurotypical parent with their children. So what's it been like for you being his advocate, making sure that he gets to be as integrated into the friendships and school as any other child? Oh my gosh, it's been such a journey because, you know, I knew IEPs, ind individual education plans as a speech therapist, right? So I knew them, I knew them very well. And then to come at it from the parental side is something completely different because 
you know, when he was going transitioning from early intervention into the school system, we had the comprehensive evaluation, we had our initial IEP and the therapist, they all knew that I was a speech therapist, and they still tried to short him on his time. And they were trying to not provide the amount of service that he needed. And so we really had to look at getting an advocate. And thankfully, it, you know, we're in California and Los Angeles, and the regional center has a Lanterman Law Clinic was our regional center. They had advocate attorneys that would come to our meetings for free because, you know, advocates wow. are not cheap. No, they're not cheap. <laughs> they're not cheap. And so for a handful of years, I, I, re, I relied on the advocate, advocate to come with me because I myself didn't, I, I could ask for so much, but the advocate could back it up with legal jargon and other things like that. So, um, you know, having to go the advocate route, I didn't think I would need it because I was a speech therapist and new IEPs, but it turns out I did. And it's okay, <laughs> you know, to have to rely on somebody for that. But, um, you know, we haven't had to use one for the past couple years. And I think that we've had a really good team. And I think it's also building rapport with the team, you know, because at a school, the IEP team, you know, they have his behavioral interventionist, which helps with his one-on-one -on -one and, you know, just making sure he does continue to get that one-on-one -on -one adult support is really important for him, but also making sure he's mainstreamed and that he does, you know, they, we had like um, the speech therapist at his previous elementary school, they would do like a lunchtime social group like once or twice a week, yep. making sure he was getting socialized and that people were empathetic, uh, his classmates, because sure. he's at that age where bullying happens and you don't want that at all. And it breaks your heart when you hear that, you know, your child was crying because their friend was making fun of them. And right. um, so it's a, it's a lot, it's a journey. It's a, it's a continuous journey. And I feel like it's never ending because, you know, our kids are a little bit different and they make friends a little bit different and they, they might react in social, social situations a little bit different and they might have immature jokes and understanding about yeah. social interaction and, and um, I'm very protective of who he, who he plays and with and. Yeah. And you brought up a, a very important topic, and that is the bully issue. Um, again, if you saw my son walking down the street, had no idea who he was or anything, he, you would think he's just you know another kid on the block. Um, but he had two bullies from preschool all the way through high school, two that just tormented him and one who sexually assaulted him. Oh my gosh. Now, my son is the type of person who doesn't, he doesn't want to embarrass anybody else, let alone he doesn't want to embarrass himself. And he didn't want to hurt his dad and I. And he held that in until three years ago. And when we finally found out I mean, the trauma that he was going through was tough. But what I went through, because I thought, what kind of mother am I? I sort of knew he had this bully in his life, but it wasn't constant. There were times that I could intervene or get the school to intervene. And it's I thought it was going away, and it didn't. So to the parents out there, bullying is a big issue and um i keep saying this we all have disabilities we we all can look strange at some point okay um none of us can get out of this world without some sort of bullying but if your child comes home and says somebody is bothering them you've got to be their advocate right away because um, it just tears me apart that it took my son all that time. And luckily he's in therapy and therapy has been working. And, uh, but he was trying to save himself 
in us. Not so much the boy, but he just kept thinking if he said anything early on, either the school was going to look at him as being the troublemaker or mom and dad were going to say the things we said so many times before. Oh, don't hang out with that person. Hang out with somebody else. It doesn't work that way. So uh, I only hope that your son does not have to truly face that as he grows up. But he, you said that he is in an integrated classroom. And despite some of his less abilities, does he recognize that he's different in any way? And if he does, how does that affect him? He absolutely knows that he is different. He knows, you know, he can only use his left hand, but he's not um, ashamed of it, you know, because we were at the park and we were playing, uh, his dad was playing uh, football, like catch with his uh, cousin and his cousin's friends from high school, because he's a freshman in high school now. Uh, so the cousin's friends were at the park as well. So they were all playing a little bit. Few, a few of the kids and then my son wanted to throw the football and his and my cousin's um, friends commented oh he only uses one hand so he throws only you know he, how you prepare you have you have to hold the ball right. two hands and get ready to throw it and the, the friend wasn't teasing him he was just like oh wow he only uses one hand and then my son said, yeah, I don't use the right hand. He kind of lifted his arm up to show him that his right arm is really not functional. He can kind of lift the arm up, but not really use it. But he wasn't ashamed of it. He was like, oh, you know, I don't use, you know, I can't use it. Um, the times where he does get a little uh, embarrassed is when he has a seizure at school. And then, you know, because everybody's looking at him like, oh, right. wait, you know, what happened? What's going on? Is he okay? Like some of them are saying, is he okay? And some of them are like, oh gosh, you know, you don't know what they're thinking. So he gets embarrassed uh, when he does have a seizure. And, um, but otherwise he's a pretty positive kid. You know, there has been incidents where he thinks that a, a peer is teasing him or laughing at him or making a joke about some kind of behavior he has you know like he has a he tends to clap his hands uh, when he gets really excited and um you know sometimes people make fun of that but other other than that you know he does know he's different but i don't think it i don't think it uh, impacts his social interactions his want to socially interact and he's not withdrawn in the classroom um he doesn't have that many strong peer friends, but he doesn't shy away from saying hi to people and, you know, trying to have a conversation. So he must have a lot of support at home for him to feel secure enough. And that is, that's the key, you know, and that's one of the things that we encouraged. We never, you know, when my son would say, they tell me that I can't play baseball with them. And I'll say, well, why not? Well, the reason why not wasn't so much that he didn't have the ability, <clears throat> but my son was so focused on playing baseball, like the major league, because he studied it and knew it to the nth degree. You know, it was like, no, I'm just not going to swing at any ball. And they'd say, but you have to. And he'd go, if it's way over there, <laughs> why am I swinging at it? And kids would get very upset with them. The coaches would get upset with them. And so finally, what we did, we sat down with the school and we said, how can we integrate him so that he's part of sports? Don't say that he can't play, but use his ability. I mean, he started coaching the football, not coaching, he was a team manager, but he would tell the coach, certain things about players and the coach would say how did you see that and that's one of his great abilities if he was out on the field he probably could play but if he got hit the wrong way that would have caused a meltdown so instead 
we found that way for him to be integrated. And parents have to look at what their kids can do and want to do to make a difference in their lives. And obviously you and your husband are doing a great job and thank goodness that his cousins and their friends, you know, understood, hey, isn't that great? He only uses one hand to throw a football instead of mocking him for it. Love that. Yeah, yeah. You know, his par his dad and I are not married, but we co-parent really well. And we have very different parenting styles, you know, but I think it really complements the our styles complement each other because, you know, his dad is a little bit more, he can be very more strict. And so when, when it comes to like the physical activities, like working out and having to work the side that's weaker, he's great with that, you know, and um, I'm, I'm more building up his confidence for conversation, interaction. Um, and then we both, you know, are so encouraging and uh, I think we try to put him in a good mindset because, you know, if you have a positive mindset and you just try to, you know, do your best, then you can't fail, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And as I have learned as an adult, I wish I had known it as a child, um, Failure is just one more step of learning something. And, you know, m my youngest son finally has has that understanding. Okay, I made a mistake. I'm going to go back and look at that mistake and see how I could do it differently in the future. And he did it many, many more years earlier than me. So I, I'm very grateful for that. Well, one of the questions I ask a lot of my guests who come on this program, as a special needs parent, right now, you're still there, you're parenting, he lives in your home. What does the future look like? Because some of us are so afraid to plan for that future. What happens if we're not around? You know, do we want them to become a ward of the state? Are they capable of being on their own? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a hard question. I, I, I always imagined myself being there, <laughs> but yeah, you know, to, to think about me not being there or his dad not being there, <clears throat> I think I would definitely lean upon uh, family members if possible. You know, I think uh, we have a pretty good tribe of people that um, could be supportive for him. I think he could learn to be independent Um Ideally, you know, uh, maybe live in a community home if needed. They do have those, and but some of them are great and some of them are not so great. So finding a community home that would be supportive and, and clean and helpful and, and positive would be a really, really important. Um, and, you know, my son might never be able to drive because he only sees peripherally midline to left and he has his seizures so he might never be able to drive but they have those Waymo cars now yep. <laughs> <laughs> or you know self-driving cars so I think he can learn to be independent if he needed to get a ride share or something um, technologically he's more advanced than I am he can figure things out on the iPad and the computer and you know so I think technology is going to be helpful um and, you know, hopefully he will never become a ward of the state because that just seems depressing. <laughs> well, absolutely. And that's why I encourage many of the parents who I coach is look at your tribe. And if you don't have one, start creating one um, because it is so important. And my husband and I, when our son was first diagnosed, it was like, oh, what are we going to do? And I have two older brothers and they both are exceptional with my son. And we said, oh, well, either one of them. And then we thought, wait a second, they're older than us by quite a difference. And it's like, that's, that's not the way to go. And so we did talk to his cousins who are older than him. He's got an older brother and 
we knew that we had things in place. We didn't legally put it in place. Um, looking back now, I wish we had if something had happened early on. At this point, he's very functional. Uh, as I said, he's living on his own, working in a field that he loves. And, uh, you know, we support that. But you still need a tribe. You still need people around you who understand you, who can accept you for whatever your limitations may be. So he turned 12 years old. Did we have a birthday party or anything? We, he wanted to go, um, sorry, excuse me. He wanted to go to this arcade called Round One. And he wants, I wanted to do arcade and bowling. And that was, that, that was what he wanted to do. And the next day we went to Universal Studios. So he had a birthday weekend and he was, you know, he fell asleep by nine o'clock on Saturday, which he, on the weekend, he never does. <laughs> he was asleep pretty early last night too. So he had a good time. Um, he, it was a very small gathering. His cousin was there and a couple other friends. Um, but, you know, he had a great time and and he's happy to be 12. And he's, you know, he's going to be taller than me. I'm five foot four and he's going to be taller than me by my next birthday, I think. <laughs> he's yeah, well, my son tall. certainly surpassed both his dad and I. He stands six foot two. So, um, you know, dad and I both look up to him, but that's okay. Um, you know, you want your kids to grow up, you want them to, you know, thrive. And it sounds like he is. And how can my listeners follow you, learn more and maybe, you know, get some more tips? Yeah, absolutely. So I do have a website is called playdumbandsabotage.com. And then I'm also on Instagram as at playdumbandsabotage. And my personal one is JT808, um, you know, because I am a, a parent of a special needs child, but I also am a speech therapist and love working and training parents on how to develop early language development. So they can find all my resources uh, on my website. And, you know, I do have a book if they would like any strategies and such. Sounds wonderful. Well, that will all be in the show notes. So nobody has an excuse not to find you. And I want to thank you so much. And Wish your son a happy birthday from us. Thank you so much. Have Thank a great you. day. Have a wonderful day now. Bye-bye.